So welcome everyone to an In Conversation with Gina. Hi Gina, thank you so much for giving your time today. You're very welcome. It's lovely to be with you, Emma. Oh. Um, if you haven't met me before, my name is Emma Smith. I'm the project manager with a project called Empowered Conversations, which is a project of AUK Salford. Um, so our plan for today is I'm going to give you a little bit of background on Empowered Conversations and then Gina and I are going to have a chat. And at any point, you can drop your questions in. We'll make sure we've got time at the end to pick up questions. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, you should see a Q&A or a chat function. I know a few of you found that already. So pop your questions in there or your comments and we'll pick them up as we go along. Um, so Empower Conversations, what do we do? We empower families affected by dementia to live as well as they can by keeping um, by keeping channels of communication and connection open. And we do that by delivering communication courses. So we have Empowered Conversations and also Moving Beyond Words. We deliver therapeutic support to family carers through Empowered, um, empowered Carers. We have regular webinars like this, and we have a few um, online groups as well. So Gina, that's yes. my blurb now. That I've got my blurb out of the way. The last time we met, we had Tony with us. We did. We had Tony husband with us. And um, I really wanted to start talking about Tony because he was a massive, and still is, a huge influence in my life when I met him eight years ago. Um, yeah, he tragically died in October of a heart attack on Westminster Bridge on his way to a, what would have been a lovely event, or I'm sure it was, although people didn't know at the time, um, for Private Eye, because he, he did his job strip for Private Eye for about 37 years. Um, and yeah, I, I, I met him eight years ago through um, a, a kind of an event that he came down to from from Hyde in Manchester to talk about his dad's book because his dad had dementia. Take care, son. You know that book, Emma, don't you? And some of some people listening or watching might might know that as well. It's an amazing book. It came out in 2014, and he read that um, with his great storytelling way about him and his charm and and compassion. And I was just really bowled over and and, and sort of inspired by him. We had a little chat afterwards, um, and he said, "If ever you need any cartoons doing," and I thought, "Well." why would I need a cartoon doing? I didn't think about it. Um, and I did contact him a few months later and I asked him for the Alliance. This was in the, sort of the early days of the Alliance. If he'd come back down to Exeter and do the same again. But I said, unfortunately, we don't have any money. But we could pay for your overnight accommodation, your train fare. And he said, yes, because that's the sort of kind man he was. And the rest is history. Oh, it was a massive, massive presence in the dementia community wasn't he huge so we we still you he did as a drawing probably that same year 2014 maybe 2013 he did us like a little sketch and we finish our course with that little sketch because it absolutely sums up everything that we've covered in in the course so well and we go and here's Tony husband's picture and we pass it around and everyone has a look Susie saying he was an amazing human. He really was, Susie. He was. Hi, Susie. Susie's up in Scotland. Well, I know that she doesn't work there. I think you're up in Scotland, Susie. Um, thanks for joining in. But yeah, and, and the thing is, I, I spoke to somebody yesterday and, and they mentioned Tony or somebody that I knew that didn't know I knew Tony, knew him. He, um, oh, she is in Scotland. Yeah, such a long way from us in Exeter and Devon. I hope it's warm up there as well, Susie. Um, and he... Um, he made such an impact. And the great thing is, like you said, Emma, and I love to hear that, is that he his legacy will live on, live on because everything that I do in my dementia work, whatever that is, he always features somehow. He always features in, in his cartoons and things. So, yeah, an amazing man that I miss so, so much. So, so much. I have two Tonys in my in my phone and, and every so often I'd be texting the other Tony, not Tony Husband, and Tony would send me, Tony Husband would send me a lovely text back going, Emma, I think it's the other Tony that you meant. Oh. He would always be really kind and patient when he sent it and then go, and anyway, how are you? <laughs> and I'd go, oh, Tony, I'm sorry, I've done it again. Yeah. But we met, I mean, it was in it was in COVID and you hadn't even talked about United at that point. You might have been, you might have mentioned it a little bit, but, you know, things moved on pretty quick after that. Yeah, Abs absolutely. Yeah, we did. We did talk in COVID. And, and I, I remember chatting very, very briefly to you, Emma, about the idea of United, which I think at that time um, we were actually going to call it together. So it changed. 
And actually, when, when Tony said United, I thought, well, he's only saying that because of Manchester United, because he loves it so much. But actually, it was it's perfect, United, because in this, in this whole thing of dementia, we are united. We are trying to come together, aren't we? So, yeah, and Tony, you know, we talk, we've done calendars before that, that received sort of, well, you know, great acclaim and things. And then, you know, I said to Tony, I'd love to do something around carers. I think in COVID, it was huge, wasn't it? All the services were dropped. And yeah, we went, a lot of people went online, but that didn't suit everyone. And I really, you know, I really advocate for people with dementia, but I also feel that I equally advocate for families as well. Um, and I um, said to Tony, suggested to him about doing a, a book about family carers. And he said, great idea. Thankfully and luckily, he already had a publisher that would listen to our idea um but that was a bonus and they liked the idea so then they were like see you later come and bring us some work come and bring us a manuscript and it was like what does that look like <laughs> um to be honest it, it took a long time it took a lot of tender loving care a lot of compassion I would say it's it's the standout moment of my life I mean there are others but right at this moment it's a standout moment of my life because of the way Tony and I worked together it was incredibly difficult to link in to try and find family carers to work with um, because it was COVID so we kind of reached out to different charities there was people that I knew of and, and things like that and we linked up with them the idea was Tony would be up in his studio in Manchester his little studio there with all his album covers and his music around him I was down here in Exeter and when we found one family we'd literally get them on Zoom we'd have a chat with them so I would ask lots of questions I'm very curious I, I think that I, I, some people say nosy but I would say curious I like to I love people I love to know about people I love to know what makes their heart sing and what makes them happy and sad etc so I was asking lots and lots of questions gleaning a lot of information Tony was there making a few little notes and doodling as he always does but that's how he focuses he doodles in the background and then he'd chirp in and say a few things and then kind of we just went away I created some narrative Tony then created some pencil drafts, pencil roughs, he called them. And then he sent them to me. We looked at them. We filled around with it a bit, you know, from, from a distance remotely. And then took the brave step of sharing it with the family, which was scary. And I need to take, so, so basically just to give people some context, and I know a lot of people maybe um, on here now will have read the book and it is really easily accessible. One of the things that carers say to me is I haven't got time to read a book which I get, I know they haven't. But then some people will say, or I'll say, well, have your favourite tipple, maybe just pick one story, 11 or 12 pages, it won't take you more than 10 minutes. It's a bit of a resource, really, and the resource at the back. And I've lost my train of thought. I was coming to something, and I was totally... We're sharing the animations back, the cartoons back with the families. And That's right, yeah. about that. Absolutely, you're on the ball. Thank you so much. So there's seven stories. Six of them are true family stories. One of the six is in the public domain because it's about Nobby Styles and his son talking about the story. Um, obviously, in the in the World Cup in 1996, um, 1966. And then the the final story, or one of the stories, not the final at the end, is Sienna's story, which I actually created. I'm going to read that at the end. Um, and the reason I created that was because I looked at all the stories and some of them overlap and some of them contain different information. And then I thought, there's a few things here. We haven't got loads of space, but I'd love to create one story that would cover something like young onset dementia, future care planning. So I created Sienna's story. Um, but when we had our first story sort of drafted, um, and we learned a lot from this, actually. I sent it through to, um, it was Kate and Fred's story, sent it through to Kate. Um, we had to anonymise them, by the way, because that was how it worked with the publisher. And I didn't hear anything for two days. And I said to Tony, oh, my God, she doesn't like it. Oh, no. Oh, my God, what do I do? And I'm a bit, I'm a bit sort of like, I want to know. I'd rather know she doesn't like it now than, you know, I'd rather she was honest um what because I knew at the time that, that we could change it you know it was just that anyway I was about to contact her and then I received a message saying I'm so sorry I haven't been in touch I was it was so hard hitting emotionally and heartfelt that I was just like she was she was in shock she was flabbergasted because it was so right so that was great <laughs> but um you know it was um 
it was a challenge because I, I didn't realize that so we we only needed to change a little bit really little bits and pieces with that one and then it made us think I said to Tony what I'm going to do is each of the other um, storytellers contributors I'm going to say to them how do you want to receive your draft do you want to receive it online with us both on here at the same time do you want to receive it in an email at eight in the morning or would you rather see read it at night some people if they get it in their inbox at night they might be looking through their bits and pieces not that we should be late at night because we then can't sleep but they do and then they'll be all emotional about it so this might sound a really silly thing but actually it's a really huge thing about how they want to receive that um or do they want me to ring them and say it's on its way now i'm here at the end of the phone so so that's what we did for the rest of the stories I think ask me some more ask me some more questions emma because otherwise i'll be going <laughs> <laughs> no i just think that's a really compassionate way you know you sort of learn from your first story that was you know you were waiting for two days and you and you learned from that and you changed it and you you know you you met people where they were and it is it's hugely emotional isn't it to have somebody else capture your story and that they are really hard stories that that were captured um so yeah, I could I, I can imagine that would be really helpful for people to think about. Yeah, I want to speak to Gina actually about this because it's triggered triggered me to think about this. Now I need a bit of support. So fantastic. So anybody who wants the book, Gina. So if anyone's not come across it, if they don't have it on their bookshelves, you've got. <laughs> how do people buy it? Just go to the shop. It's there. It's United. It's Gina Awad and Tony Husband. Anything else they need to know? Um. Well, I'm going to say, do you know what? This is true, Emma. I don't have money, but I mean, I can survive. If I did, I would literally, I mean, I have got a few in my cupboard, but I have to pay for them. But if I could, I would literally buy a whole load, fill up a, a cupboard and just give them out because I want people to have them. I mean, I still pay for them as I sell. I get a little bit of a discount, but I just want people to have them, which actually leads me on to they can also borrow it from every library in England and Wales. And it's going to be translated into Welsh soon. How is that even possible, Gina? Well, I'll tell you a little story. I'll tell you how it happened. So I don't know if people have heard of Reading Well. I know somebody tune, some people tuning in will do. Reading Well or Reading Agency, as far as I'm aware, and correct me if I'm totally wrong because I haven't got exactly the you know necessarily every piece of information right. But the Reading Agency started up as a charity in 2013 and they created or they, they sort of um, curated a group of books that they felt would be of interest in certain sort of topics. Dementia was one, there's teenagers, there's long-term health conditions. So in 2015, the first set of resources came out um, for Reading Well, and there were 35, I believe, 35 um, books and resources, and that meant that they were available in every library in England and Wales. Anyway, I knew about it at that time purely because I just started my journey in the Dementia Action Alliance. And they were actually launching in our Exeter library the first group of books. It was like, oh, they asked me to say a few words. I was a dementia champion. I delivered dementia sessions for the Alzheimer's Society. So I said a few words, really passionate about it, as I am with dementia. And then a couple of years ago, I'd heard that they were revamping it so they wanted to get a new a new set of resources not because the old ones were, weren't good still but obviously they were but they just wanted to curate them and specifically which they would have done then as well they wanted to co-produce it they wanted it to be involved in co-production they wanted people with dementia and their families to basically re look read these books and review them because they're the lived they're, they're the people with the lived experience you know i've got um experience of family members of dementia and also caring for people with dementia but you know it's it was really important for them to be involved in that which they were with innovations in dementia which was incredible and then of course the books were reviewed by academics charities Alzheimer's society Alzheimer's society dementia carers count all that sort of thing um and then they curated it. And so this took a couple of years to, to out of consultation. And then a few months ago, I heard out of those 20 books, United was one of them. How exciting. Ooh. Amazing. That's, quite, that's so, just fantastic. I was so excited. And also what's great is Tony Husband's Take Care Son was also in there. So he's the only author that features twice out of the 20 books. So, yeah, yay, Tony, up there, wherever you are. You, we love you. Um, and so, basically, those um, 20 books are available in every library in English, England, England and Wales, and they will be translated into Welsh in the coming months. So, that was actually launched in 
uh, uh, yeah, in the House of Commons um, during Dementia Action Week. I just wanted to say, just say something here, if I can read it, Emma, because a lot of people that I speak to, even in the in the sector, they have no idea about the Reading World book list. So I don't know what you can see here. Yeah, Is that back yeah, 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 yeah. No, so, right. So, so that's what you'll see in the library. So it says Reading Well for Dementia. It's a little A5 flyer. It shows all the books inside. Um, what I love, and not many people have got these because they only created them for the launch. You've got a little bookmark and it's got all the books on the back. Oh, wow. Fantastic. So I give some away, but I'm going to make sure I keep some as a souvenir. Um, so, um, yeah, it's a great initiative. And it says here, which post-diagnostic, post-diagnosis support, don't get me started on that. But anyway, post-diagnosis support is a core part of the dementia diagnosis pathway, as we know. But it's very patchy across the country, probably globally. And people affected by dementia should be provided with information, support and access to appropriate community resources, which is obviously this one, one of this parts. Um, evidence shows that reading is a powerful and effective health and well-being intervention. Through reading, people can access health information, book based therapy and shared stories that provide support and combat stigma. So that's what this is all about. And some of the books on here, you've got some for children. You've got Steve Thompson, who's a rugby player. He's in his early 40s. He's living with young onset dementia. Um, you've got all sorts here. A real good combination. You've got some academic stuff, and you've got things that are a lot more easier to read um, and accessible, like United, and, of course, Tony's Take Care Son. So, yeah, it's, um, it's a very, very well-endorsed um, initiative. So, um, Susie just asked, is that in Scotland as well? No. Do you know what, Susie? I was thinking about you today because we had a little bit of to and fro last night on WhatsApp, didn't we? And we shared each other pictures of each other's cockapoos. Um, and um, no, it's not. And I don't know why. Um, I, you know, th there's obviously reasons for that. But I mean, so they're, they're obviously not in Scottish libraries, but um, they should be. They should be. They should be. A question to be raised. Yes, and she agree. I, I agree. I agree as well, Susie. Yeah. Who's going to raise that question? I'm going to have my last slip of tea. Who's raising that question? How do we find out? Yeah, actually, Susie, is there anything? Because Susie, sorry, Susie's um, based in Scotland. And remind me who you work for. Do you work for Alzheimer's Scotland, Susie? I know you do great research work. You're a real creative genius, aren't you? I don't want to embarrass you. Alzheimer's Scotland. So. Um, I mean, we're not going to suddenly revamp all this and make it available in Scotland. Um, and obviously I can share with you the books and you can see them online and they can be shared there. But yeah, I wonder if we can find out about that, Susie. Can you do that? No pressure. No pressure. <laughs> She's going to look, into, look it. into it. Thank you. Brilliant. You're well done, Susie. That. You're held to that because this is recorded, Susie. I'll be on your case in two months. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's reading well. That's that's a lovely sort of, you know, development, isn't it, within the book, that it's now in in all the English libraries, it's going to be in the Welsh libraries, and when Susie gets her fingers in and claws in, it's going to be in the Scottish libraries as well. So that's that's exciting for the book. It really it is. is. It's really exciting. Can I just say one thing? Cool. Can I just say one thing? It, I'm smiling because I remember when this was out to consultation, the Alliance, we automatically got like an email thing. It was a generic email saying, you know, um, it, it, we're doing this consultation. Can you recommend any books? Obviously, I recommended mine, but it doesn't mean I'm going to get in there. I just recommend it. I recommended Wendy Mitchell's, who, again, is so sadly no longer with us. Fantastic three books she's done. One of the, her first one is actually in um, in the list as well. Um, and what was I saying there? Uh, oh, yes. So I said, no, I've gone again. See, so the, you got a general email to the Alliance. Yes. So, so I, I um, and then it was left. So then I contacted uh, Gemma at the reading agency and I said, how long does this take? Because I'm a little bit impatient. I just wanted to know either way. And she said, it's a long time. Kind of just forget it. Um, and then, of course, they go to consultation and then they, they shortlist it. They shortlist any books. And so but but of course, it's all uh, linked up with the criteria. So it's it's depending on what criteria they're looking at. So this fitted a criteria in the fact that it was illustrated and it was accessible. And a lot of people with dementia and their families um, have enjoyed reading it and given really good feedback. That's brilliant. Gina, you've mentioned the Alliance a few times. And for anyone who doesn't know, that's the... Exeter Dementia Action Alliance and it's been 
going for 10 years. You've just celebrated your 10 year birthday, haven't you, a few months ago? We have. And you know what? I genuinely don't know how 10 years has come and gone. Well, I do because life goes fast. But I also don't know how we've managed to genuinely keep going. And I'm not saying that because I'm negative because I'm far from it. I'm saying that because it's been really, really tough. So just, and this is not, a, oh, we need money or whatever. It's not about that. But I think what's really important for me, because a lot of people have agendas, they have ideas of thoughts about what we do, why we do it, what our agenda is. And that that's quite scary, really, because all we want to do is help people with dementia. By raising awareness and delivering information sessions to businesses anywhere and everywhere around the city, to try and disband some of that stigma and explain to people what dementia can be like. Um, and I used to deliver dementia friend sessions through the Alzheimer's Society, but now we're in the middle of creating our own sessions called Dementia Care Sessions. Care being the acronym for compassion, awareness, respect and equality. And actually three weeks before Tony died, I said to him that we were gonna be looking at these new sessions. Um, is there any way with those letters and those words you could create an image for each one um, and he said yes, which he, he was going to do. Um, he'd done, I think, three, two days before I'd gone on holiday, full colour. And then I said to him, I know you're busy because he had lots of stuff to do. Can you please do the last one before you go on holiday, before I go on holiday? And he did. But then two days, a day after I got back from holiday, he died. So it's so weird and strange, whether you call it serendipity, I don't know. So this kind of going forward, this next phase of some of the work for the Alliance is, is around that session and how we're going to make it more sort of collaborative and lived experience. So there'll be more stuff around the lived experience, storytelling and things like that. And so going back to the Alliance, so we've been going 10 years. So when I first called, I won't go into great detail about how it all happened because it's such a long story and we'll be passing our hour. We've got other things to talk about. <laughs> but... Um, we um, set up the Alliance, a little call to action 10 years ago when I heard about the National Dementia Action Alliances and I knew that Plymouth, our nearest city, was doing something and I thought, well, they must be doing something behind the scenes in Exeter, we just don't know about it. And then they weren't and they said, well, you can set something up and I thought, well, what does that mean? What does that look like? I was doing a degree in health and social care at the time at the Open University and working um but um anyway I, I long story short I did set that up so for the first two or three years it was totally voluntary um and I was living and breathing it I still am living and breathing it but I do get um some some finance now but we don't we don't have any employees so we have me driving it I am paid for 16 hours a week but I choose to do a lot more because I just want to. I'm passionate about it. And then we have a board. We've got Joe, who's an amazing support and created our Cozy Roots project. And we've got a great board um, and we meet every quarter. Other than that, they let me get on with it, which is good, because if I had these boxes around me and loads of bureaucracy and red tape, I'd feel like a shrinking butterfly. I need to be a free spirit and do what I want to do and what I, what I can do. So. So that's what we do. So. So when I said about and I was like gasp for the 10 years, it's because. We've never had any core funding. It's always been little bits of money coming in through goodwill gestures and things like that. And we've still survived. But literally every few months, I'm like, oh, my God, how are we going to get some money to go on for another few months? And I don't want to be a fundraiser. All yeah. I want to do is help people with dementia. But um, we do great things. We're doing the care sessions. We're also doing um, dementia interpreter sessions. We've partnered up with Training to Care in Essex. You probably know the virtual dementia tour. Some of you um, watching might have experienced the virtual dementia tour, which is an immersive eight minute experience, simulation of what it might feel like to live with moderate dementia. Um, the dementia interpreters that I'm delivering is um, I'm delivering that every month at the moment. And we've actually been really, really fortunate. I'm going to give a really big um, shout out to Simon Armand. Simon Armand, I know you're not listening because you're probably busy doing what you do really well. But Howard, his father is. Are you still there, Howard? Or have you disappeared? I hope you're still there. What I want, the reason I want to say thank you to Simon is because I approached him at the beginning of the year and I said, we've paid for a license to deliver dementia interpreter sessions for the next two years. Cost quite a bit of money, but I believed in it. Oh, he is there. Hi, thank you. Big shout out to you and Simon. And um, 
so we paid for this license. The idea was I was going to go out and engage with the community and try and encourage them to pay for these sessions, these group, small group sessions. And I did that once and it took me months to try and even get paid by the invoice because of the financial process and everything like that. And I thought, I can't do this. I'm going to end up doing invoices every week. So I thought it's really hard to engage with the community because I do it really well. But if you're trying to get into a doctor's surgery and you want to get into another one, you hope that one can link you up with the other. But they're totally separate. They can. So then you've got to go through, we all know this, an admin address, an admin email. And it might get put to the bottom of the list and you never hear. So I approached Simon. I put together a pr proposal and I said, would you consider funding nine monthly sessions of the Dementia Interpreters Programme? And he said, yes. So thank you, Simon. So I'm about to deliver next week my fourth session. There's groups of six on each one. And I'm inviting people like social prescribers, care home managers, people have got one chap coming next week whose dad lives with dementia and he reached out to me because he'd heard that we had some funded sessions different people i'm going to inv be inviting domiciliary care agencies and it's all around communication it's how we communicate because as we know we're big communicators verbally but what about when we can't speak and sometimes people with dementia can't speak not always but some can so it's about being a little bit of a private investigator and trying to interpret the things that people might do when they're not using, um, you know, the mother tongue. So and um, so, yeah, it's really exciting. So I'm loving doing that. That's another aspect of what we're doing at the moment. And I think the other thing for us as an alliance is we want to do more campaigning. We definitely want to do some campaigning. And Joe and I at the moment, I'm not, I don't think she's listening today. She's probably busy, but um, and I don't you've probably heard about this, Emma, but all the hospital trusts over over the UK deal with things very differently. And um we're very, very keen to make sure that blue bands or blue bracelets are there in hospitals for people when they get diagnosed with dementia, as in if they're admitted, they have a hospital admission that they're seen. It's not to make them stand out, but it's that we understand that people with dementia and if it's more advanced need more complex care. So therefore, they need to be seen because the treatment that they would receive, we all want the right treatment, but it might be a little bit different. So we're doing a bit of campaigning around that at the moment, working closely with the local hospital. And and we're also going to be involved in the new Devon Dementia Strategy, which um, has been a long time coming. So that's what we're doing as an alliance. But of course, every, every alliance or dementia-friendly town, however they term them, are doing different things. And it's based on what that community needs or what they want. Wow, you're doing loads. <laughs> <laughs> sorry i've talked for england I think, no don't haven't. worry don't worry oh, people say keep up the good work it's amazing and and then we had someone saying that they went on the interpreter um session and it was fantastic it was oh, enlightening really? yeah so sally said it was absolutely it was enlightening so there oh, you go. thank you sally thank so, you for anyone who hasn't come across dementia interpreters before do you want to just give them a quick summary of what that is so training to care, um, dementia, dementia interpreters is, is, so for example, the session, actually, Sally, you could say this, but you can't because you can't speak, can you? you? It's just me and Emma speaking. <laughs> actually, sir, can, I, can I just say, Emma, that actually Sally works for Age UK in Exeter? Oh, hi, Sally. Hi, Sally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah. So it's basically, we talk, we do a couple of activities, but I'm not going to give it away because it will spoil it. A couple of activities around what communication means. We touch on aphasia, which is the inability to maybe receive information and interpret information and express ourselves. And they say sometimes, I mean, there's a lady that I've been looking after recently where she's not able to have a general dialogue with me. I understand what she's trying to say because I can, but other people might not. And they, they call that, there's a term for it. I don't know whether I like it or not. They call it word salad. Well, there's all sorts of different words and things. Um, so um, we talk about that. And then the main part of it, all, which is after the 15 minute breaks, it's a three hour session is um, where we have our senses. What's the word? I've gone blank when the, the, the senses are taken away. You're uh, um, inability to speak. So we put these black things. So it sounds it, it is funny, actually, because it, it really makes you think and feel because you can't express yourself. You have to put something in your mouth and then I give everyone a little card and individually they have to read their card and then the the rest of the group have to work out what they're saying. And um, sometimes they can, sometimes they can't. 
And then I ask for a volunteer. I either say, you'd love to be a volunteer, wouldn't you? Or um, I say, who would like to volunteer to be the person in care? And usually I get someone that, that does. And the idea then is that person will then have to wear some goggles. So it's not dissimilar for the virtual, the, to the virtual dementia tour, but it's, it is, it's different in, in some ways because it's all around communication. So then they'll wear some goggles where they can't see properly. And then they're given something to say. So they, before they put the goggles on, they'll be given a statement. They remember that statement. They put the black thing in their mouth. They put the goggles on. And then they try and express that statement. And again, the people around are looking and, and trying to ascertain what they're saying. Yeah, aphasia. Yeah, aphasia. That, no, sorry, I didn't mean that. No, that wasn't that about too, sensory but, changes. Yeah, I was. Yeah, I was meaning sensory changes. Yeah, aphasia is the wording. But yeah, I was talking about sensory change. And then, and then it's headphones, and then it's a jacket. But that's all I'm going to say. And then we'll talk about the Dementia Dictionary, which is a great resource and you can download that application free. And anyone that comes on the training course then will be classed as a level one, having a level one certificate in the Dementia Interpreters. And you can go up the levels, but we're as Exeter, in Exeter, we're just delivering that that one, um, that one level at the moment. But um, I love doing it. I love doing it. it. Sounds like a really creative way to raise... Um understanding and well to be immersed in in the difficulties around communication for people with dementia so we come away with a better understanding of the challenges that people might face yeah and I also think Emma one of the things that the feedback that I get from most people is what's great is at the beginning we all have an introduction none of this role play business but it's like why are you here what's important to you how are you touched by dementia and it's those story sharing people sharing their own real life experiences and that's what people say at the end this is great because there's no powerpoint I can't do PowerPoint. I struggle with PowerPoint. I need to learn it, but it's no, not my... No, don't. Stay away from it. The yeah, time of PowerPoint not... has been and gone. Let it go. Let it die. Let it let yeah, die. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye, PowerPoint. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We never use PowerPoint on our communication courses. We think it's really important. And you're right. Bringing people together and those stories that they share and the support they offer one another, quite often they get more out of that, I think, than our, than our course. So at least as much... You know, it's just so powerful when you do that and you bring people together. Okay, so I think I know what's next. Is there anything else that's coming up for the Alliance? Stay away from PowerPoint. Yeah, stay Great. away from PowerPoint. It's evil. This is the devil. Um, by the way, everyone, this will go up on um you on your YouTube channel afterwards, won't it? So I can look back at this. And when I'm thinking, oh, somebody's asked me to do this talk and where's my PowerPoint slides, I'm going to say, mm-mm. The consensus is computer says mm -mm, no. I always just do it. If anyone ever asks me for a PowerPoint, I give them a little blurb and then I do an activity with them because that, that's what they take away. I they know. Don't take away slides. That just is the experience, isn't it? I know some people learn. You know, we all learn differently, visually, sensory, and all that. But I might have a few sheets of things which I'll show around to people, or I'll read, I'll read a poem, or tell a little story. But yeah, it's all those experiences that people go away with, isn't it? That's great. That's Sorry, your your question was about is the there anything else? Yeah, because you've said a load there. I think that probably is there anything else that you've missed about what's coming up for the alliance, or is that captured it all? I think that's captured it all. So, like tomorrow, for example, I'm doing a dementia session um, with a local care home. I'm going to Cumberland Grange in Exeter, which has been open a couple of years. I haven't been there for a while, so I'm going there. And then I've got my dementia interpreter session next week. So, to be honest, because I'm I do this, but I also support families and advocate for them as well and do other things. So although I put a lot more voluntary hours into over and above the paid job with the Alliance, I'm literally juggling going from one, putting one hat onto another hat. Um, so I have to be aware that um, we need to have like, you know, we've got to have a business plan, which is normally I, I don't do that sort of thing. But actually we need to I need to keep on point. So. The main things for us over the next couple of years is dementia interpreters, creating the dementia sessions, being responsive to anything that comes in via email and campaigning. If I see something or feel something needs to be campaigned for or somebody's approaching me, I'm going to be out there waving. Excuse me. But actually, I am an introvert, even though no one will believe me. I am an introvert. I need to process life. <laughs> Sally says you do a wonderful job. You oh, really thank do. you. <laughs> Um, so can you share a little bit about the other bits of work that you do? So how do you directly support families affected by dementia? 
Okay, so um, I started doing, I suppose you'd call, I don't know what you call me, a, they say personal assistant, don't they? I don't like that because that could be typing, doing or whatever, um, but that's what they call them. But um, I'm finding myself doing more advocacy work for families now because it just happened to fall into my lap. And and so to just uh, rewinding a little bit, I, I support uh, my lovely friend Jo, who sits on the board. I'm sure she won't. She won't, I know she won't mind me saying, but I support her husband and have been for the last couple of years. And she, um, uh, sorry, John has mixed dementia, and he lives at home. So she's fantastic. She she's just a great person, um, a great wife to John. Um, and a great carer and has tapped into people in the local community to get extra support to keep him at home because it's it's hard you know he's had dementia a number of years now so um i support i support john every monday for four hours so i see him that's my monday part of it um, and i love doing that he's taught me how to play crib but i'm rubbish but i can get away with looking like i'm doing it i have won probably twice in two years but it's probably a bit boring for him now because he's always winning, but he does like to win. I said, you're going to win again, aren't you? He said, yeah. So I make him some lunch. Uh, they've got a lovely dog. I take my dog with me. I'm really lucky. I can take River with me. They've got a dog called Freddie. I take them both out for a walk. It's in the countryside. What more could I ask for? And I'm there for John. Um, it means Joe can go out and meet some friends and go and have a walk, have a cup of coffee um and do that so I, I do that and then um I was invited well I was um somebody contacted me about a year ago through we've got something in Exeter called well we don't have it anymore actually through Devon County Council called Pinpoint so you can put up your information and profile on on the website or you could do you can't anymore and say oh, I'm Gina I work in Exeter and I, I my specialism is dementia I'm available one day a week to help support and and then somebody can get in contact with you because they look down and think, oh, right, she looks, she does dementia. Um, so I had somebody through that and I was working with that lady for about nine months. But there's a break in that for the moment. And then I've been approached recently by um, a lovely friend of mine that I hadn't seen for a long, long time. Well, actually, her friend I've been approached by who is, and I don't know if, if some of them are listening today, they might be, but they will afterwards. I'm not going to mention any names because we're right in the middle of a very, very, very complicated um, situation with social services, which I'm not going to go on a rant. But I might a little bit because I'm really angry, to be honest, because the support is not good enough. It's broken. The system is broken. But um, we're doing the best we can. So basically the lady contacted me and, she said, you're basically my last port of call. I'm literally don't know what to do. So-and-so, which was an old friend of mine, has got dementia. And her dementia is posterior cortical atrophy. It's not Alzheimer's. It's not vascular. For anyone that doesn't know, there's over 100 types of dementia. Don't get me wrong. I don't know anywhere near all of them, but I know a few. Posterior cortical atrophy, PCA is the acronym for sure, is what Terry Pratchett had. And often, not all, not exclusively, but often what happens with PCA is that the memory isn't the first thing that goes. So people wouldn't think, oh, I might have dementia because the memory wouldn't be going. They might not be able to process information. They might not be able to express themselves. They might not be able to plug a seatbelt in or open a door. Um, these things that you wouldn't know about. So and I know a bit about it because I've done a bit of research and I'm learning as I go. I'm a lifelong learner. And I... Um, so they approached me and the diagnosis was was had last year. Very, very, very little, if any, post-diagnostic support. I mean, we've lost the Alzheimer's Society locally, so there aren't any um, support workers here. We don't have an Admiral nurse in Exeter. We've got little coastal towns around us. They've got an Admiral nurse. We don't have one in Exeter. Unless you're admitted to hospital, then you have access to an Admiral nurse. That's something that is really, really challenging. So it's limited post-diagnostic support. So... Basically, they said, could I could I help? So I've been trying to help for the last six months, really. And it's just come to crisis now. So, you know, I've had to put in safeguard, safeguarding reports. And even then, putting that safeguarding report in on Sunday night at nine o'clock, huge evidence, pages of it from friends and things. I'm still waiting. I'm still waiting. But the, the challenge with this particular situation is that um, there are two friends that live together. So it's not like husband and wife or partners. They have two friends that live together. And, and the friend that's supporting the friend that's living with PCA is actually 
77 and got lots of her own health health issues. So it's not being able to sort of go and see her family and do the things that she wants to do in her retirement because she's supporting her friend. And her friend has limited support because family live away. Um, luckily, she's got a couple of friends. So we're really trying to battle with how we get more support. And it's a nightmare. So that's some of the things that I'm doing. And I, I kind of feel that um, I, I am aware that there is going to be some dementia support workers coming in in the next few months um, linked into Devon Partnership Trust. But it's it's not kind of right out there in the public domain, although it is now because I've just said it. Um, but um, so that's great. Um, but we have got and I, I just share this because I know it's going to be uploaded the brilliant virtual clinic for animal nurses. I don't know if you know that, Emma, you probably do, but Dementia UK, who hosts and, and deal with all the animal nurses, as well as other trusts that host them as well. Um, they have a, a, a phone line, but they also have, so you can phone up and leave a message or get through to someone and speak to an animal nurse if you need support. Obviously, it's not face-to-face, -face, but it's virtual, you know, it's, it's on the phone. It's something if you haven't got that. And then they've also got the virtual clinic. So you can go online and you can put in the information. So if, say, you want to know about certain things because you're being challenged in this way, you can just say, I'm looking after Mary or whatever, and this is the situation. You can then pick a slot. So actually, I might get into trouble for telling you this because they might get inundated with people <laughs> and then they might not have enough Admiral nurses and they'll have to recruit me. Um, and you can have a 45-minute virtual clinic slot and I've experienced one, so I know I know how brilliant it is. I had a lovely Admiral nurse that I was talking to to help me, one of my families, and a, a student Admiral nurse on the line as well. And it was so nice to speak face to face and just share what I needed to share. So it's another mode of support for family carers, as well as Dementia Carers Count and Together in Dementia Every Day, which are another two charities that support families for dementia. Brilliant, June. I think you've mentioned everyone. Don't worry. I know. I was like, oh, my God, who haven't I mentioned? They're going to kill me. <laughs> no, it's really helpful to mention that. Um, and, yeah, I mean, the situation with health and social care is challenging for everybody, isn't it? I don't think it matters where you are, in which part of the country, maybe rural areas, it's going to be a little bit more challenging, but it's mm. it's tough. And, you know, we, we see that. We see that with the safeguardings being raised. Do you people be you know people get into the end of the tether you know they just can't take it anymore but there's not any there's nowhere for people to go so that you know they're just waiting for a crisis for a solution to come along that's what somebody said to me yesterday I'm waiting for a crisis so that this changes so you know what do you know what it makes me so angry I know that people are busy but where is this support? Where is it? And, you know, it, there are, to be fair, there are, I know you said like a lot of places don't have it, you know, but there are some that do because I speak to other areas and they're like, oh, we get this and we get that. Um, but it's just, I mean, in an ideal world, this is my ideal world or country, is every community has a hub. You can call it what you want, a hub, a community centre or whatever, and it's a one-stop shop. They've got one in Plymouth, it's brilliant. They've got one in different parts of the country. We need one in every town. So you can go there and you can look at power of attorney. You can look at carer burnout. You can have exercise classes, have your hair done. We want a few millionaires to, to buy and create these bricks and mortar hubs across the country. Yeah. Let's all, let's all pray to win the lottery that I don't do. Um, <laughs> and then we can make this happen. Yeah. We, That's what yeah. I'd love. We need to. We need to. Because, you know... With the right support, people can live at home for, you know, and live the life they want to for longer. And that's, you know, that's the work that we try and do up here is about just, I guess, working in that preventative space, you know, keeping people well, keeping caregivers well in what they're, in what they're doing. Susie said it shouldn't be a postcode lottery and it really shouldn't, should it? No, not at all. And it, it really, really infuriates me. But I, I've never been, I've always been involved in grassroots stuff, you know, all the time since I've started this, because that's me. I'm right there, down there doing it. And all the stuff that goes up there, it's it's kind of beyond me. But what I'm finding is I'm now being drawn into some strategic stuff coming from there. So we'll meet in the middle. So actually, I realise I always used to tea, see strategic stuff as though everyone's up there. They're all really important. I'm just this little person down here, not doing very much, making a little bit happen. But actually, what I've gleaned, and this is not about a big ego, is just over the last 12 years, I've gained so much information. I actually realise I have a lot to offer to those strategic meetings from the lived experience. 
Absolutely. Age UK Exeter is bringing lots of activities together for people living with dementia and their carers. Yeah, they do Sally. loads of stuff. They do loads of stuff. They've got an allotment. They've got um, they do budding friends. They've, you've got loads of stuff, Sally. Absolutely. It's brilliant. And I should just say, Sally, like Age UKs are absolutely rocking it and doing great work. We were on about when I, when I was on about that, I was on about that wider health and social um care sort of Absolutely, I know, yeah. Sector. Um, you know, so so getting respite when people need respite you know, getting people into a care home if they need the care home. Is it the right care homes? Keeping them away from that, you know, by giving them their own budgets to use in whatever way, you know, that sort of stuff or, you know, what support they get from the hospital. So, yeah, that wider stuff, not, I guess, I, I sort of put ourselves in the in the community sphere, you know, we're, we're in that third sector, aren't we, doing mm. work? And right. I think a lot, of, a lot of, just quickly, a lot of it is is just lack of joined up, lack of joined up, lack of, you know, We've all got so many skills to offer. We got we'll put them all together. I mean, people are putting them together, but there's still these big gaps where there's hospital admissions. They're not linking up the community properly. They're trying to get people out of hospital because they need the bed and put them into a care home that's not supportive for that person living with dementia. Anyway, rant over. It is. <laughs> they need collaboration. They do, Susie. They really do need that collaboration. Um, right. We've only got 12 minutes left. <gasps> What? 12 minutes? You know, I haven't even asked my questions yet. You've just ranted now, I'm only messing you. We've, we've got through most of them, but I did just want to say, if you have a question for Gina, you've been very, very vocal in the in chat, so thank you so much. But if you have a specific question that you want to ask, ask Gina, now is your time. Gina, while they're doing that and having a chance to think about that, so what do you want to talk about? The radio show or the Royal College of Psychiatrists? Pick your... I'm gonna do I'm going to do both and I'm going to do them really quick. Okay, go on then. Radio show. Love my radio show. The producer. When I say producer, I mean, that sounds really posh. He basically puts the music on for me. Anyway, I have two guests on. It's only when there's a fifth Saturday in the month. So my fifth Saturday in the month is next week. So my next show will be on the 29th of June, then August. I've been doing it for eight years. Every single time I walk in that little studio and I say, I'm really scared. And I am literally really scared. And he says, you'll be fine. Then he says... I said, how long have we got less? He said, five, four, you're on. And I'm like, oh, and then I just do it. Anyway, I am. I feel the fear and do it anyway. I will not allow fear to stop me doing what I feel is right for me. So I'm doing that. I have some brilliant guests on. I've had about 80 guests because uh, they only probably have, I don't know, 10 a year, but um, some great guests. Um, Tony was on a couple of times. Love it. Actually, one time, I'm going to get you on, Emma. Love to have you on. Talking about empowered conversations. That'd be amazing. <laughs> yeah um um just quickly um the royal college of psychiatrists um i actually work for them on a very 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 part-time basis as in i sit on their advisory group so but that's for the program called msnap we love acronyms don't we we do if we know what they are but we don't if we don't know what they are and probably most people won't so i'll say it for you msnap Memory, oh, I've gone to say, memory services. Yeah, the Memory Services National Accreditation Accreditation Program, which basically means memory clinics can choose to be accredited by going through a big fat process of what their clinical environment is, what their lead up to diagnosis is, what PICE diagnostic support there is, what the time span is to get a diagnosis, how it all works. So it's all kind of done um, within a memory clinic all over the country you can have a look online and then they have when they're due to have their assessment their peer review um, on zoom mostly some face-to-face -face, but main ones I've done I've done zoom I've only done two so far and I started working for them last May because they're sporadic throughout the year and um, basically we sit on a group and it's a whole day and I am there as a carer representative so I'm looking at the way things are through the eyes of a carer. So for example, I can't really think of it. I can't think of a specific example because I've only done two and it was but but I think that I'm I'm always going to be looking through the eyes of the carer. So I'm wanting to know, I mean they they can't magic post diagnostic support if they haven't got the post diagnostic support. But what they have to um share and evidence is what they are doing around that and how do they do that. And um so I I sit there on that and then I will ring up, say, a couple of carers during that day that have agreed to answer sort of a list of a few questions about what their 
um, not treatment, but what how they were received when they went to the memory clinic, how it was, is there anything that was challenging for them? And then it's all about sort of reaching that accreditation. So that memory clinic is accredited and, and doing the best they can, which is great. It's really I, interesting. I had never heard that memory assessment uh, so math teams could be accredited. And that's the first time I've ever heard that in my life. Really? Wow. Yeah, honestly. I know. Does that mean that nobody's what? been accredited or does that mean that everyone's accredited? So no, 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 no. no. Feel? There's, there's absolutely loads. I don't know how many, because the thing is, when they when I was recruited, they, they said about traveling, am I happy to travel? Because it would be a day thing. So you'd have to, if it's a long way away, you'd have to stay the night before. And I said, yeah, I'm fine to do that. Um, but unfortunately, what I'm realising is that there are a few in London, but most of them are like six hours away. They're right up north. They're, they're miles away. And actually, it wouldn't be a good use of my time or anyone's time. Whereas there's other people that are care representatives like me that may be living up north. So they would go to those face to face. But most of most of the organisations, most of the clinics decide to opt for um, virtual. Hmm. But I do want to go to a, I do want to do a face to face one in clinic one. Well, that's really interesting. Yeah, I never knew about that. And, you know, you do get reports because we work across Greater Manchester. So we're based mm. in Selka, but we work across Greater Manchester. And obviously that means you've got, you know, like 10 different memory assessment teams across or, or eight to 10. Um, and some are, some have a better um, reputation and others have a worse reputation. So it's interesting mm. to know that there is that accreditation option. Yeah, so I was going to say, I don't know how it all works finance wise, but yeah, you can go on to um, SNAP or, or the Royal College of Psychiatrists and it will show you over the country an image of all the clinics that are part of this programme. And I think they have to, correct me if I'm wrong, call Royal College of Psychiatrists, I'm so sorry, but um, I think it's every couple of years or something. And then, you know, they, they work towards, yeah, different things. So, yeah. That's brilliant. Um, so our very chatty audience has gone really quiet, like really quiet, definitely quiet. They're still exactly. there. They are there, but they just can't think of any questions. You know, they've they've praised you like throughout. If you had, oh. if you ever thought that you weren't doing a good job, Gina, you should just read what people have said. You know, there's so much on here. Um, Susie has shared about um, adaptive interactions for advanced dementia. Yes, so that's Dr. Maggie Ellis. So we actually um, work with Maggie Ellis, um, Susie. So she, we have two courses. Our empowered conversations our first one moving beyond words our second one then maggie comes and does a session on that and then quite often she'll recruit caregivers from that to do her adaptive interaction so thank you so much for sharing her work that's really helpful what, what's it called is it called adaptive interactions adaptive interactions dr maggie ellis oh i like i love the sound of that hey we've done webinars with maggie have a look on on the youtube channel but yeah maggie is absolutely fantastic um, wow but, yeah, everyone is just so you you've inspired so many people. They're all they're all on here saying how much you've inspired them. So if you don't have any questions, people, and you still have a couple of minutes to ask those questions, I'm just gonna very quickly tell you about the next webinar, if I may. So we've got two left before the summer. Next week I'm gonna be chatting with Hilary Lee about the Spark of Life model of care. So she's over in Australia. They do that. Interestingly, not so much in the UK, but they do that. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And we've, then we'll do that. Yeah. Thanks, Gina. I, I just suddenly thought people might think, oh, that's it now. And they might just no, think, don't, go. don't go. Don't, don't go. go. Let I've me got plug a... this and then yeah, don't Gina's go. going to read don't go. something. It's a perfect oh. ending. Um, so, yeah, Hillary's on next week. If you've, if you've heard, heard of Spark of Life Model of Care, if you want to hear more, come and join us. It's The details are all on our website. And then we've got Christina Victor discussing the importance of looking at loneliness across the life course. So they'll be our last webinars. Nicely prompted there, Gina. I did nearly almost probably forget that we were going to share something. Oh, wait a minute. Did you say this no, webinar is going to be shared on YouTube? Maybe. It will, Mick. It'll be, on, it'll be on YouTube. So if you look at um, Empowered Conversations on YouTube, you'll find it and a ton of other um webinars that we've had including maggie ellis so i'll, I'll send you i'll send you the link mick and you can share it with diane shall i share this picture gina what shall picture? I share oh, this? yes yeah 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 okay yes. all right i'm sharing this and then i'm gonna go over to you for our final okay. word okay everyone thank you so much for tuning in
I really, really appreciate it. I just thought it'd be really nice to read um, one story from the book. It's only 11 pages. This story, Sienna's story, is um, a composite story. It's the only one that isn't a true family carer story. And the reason, um, I think I said at the beginning, actually, or maybe I said to you, Emma, before we went live, um, that, um, yeah, I think I did, that, that there were bits missing that I felt I wanted to include. And, and actually, I do have another book in my head which will develop and move on from Sienna. So it would be kind of faction. It will be based on true stuff, but it'd be slightly adapted to, to kind of weave through. Sienna will be like the, a dementia companion. And my idea is that there's so many topics I want to talk about, like more rare dementia, young onset dementia, hospital admissions, abnormal nursing, that Sienna will be the vehicle to drive those stories. So that's my idea. Um, so I'm going to read Sienna's story to you. So you can't see my face now, can you, everybody? Because obviously I'm going to be looking down. My profile isn't very nice. You just look down. We're all looking at... Don't you worry about your profile. It's gorgeous. You just you just crack on with reading it. OK, thank you, everyone. And then we'll be saying bye. This is Sienna's story. Sienna had worked in care homes in the past. But after her gran, who lived with dementia, died, she wanted to give back to the community and make a meaningful difference. After much thought, I decided to follow my heart and started working with families living with dementia in their homes. Roy is a kind gentleman living on his own with no family. He has vascular dementia. He looks forward to my visits. Ha ha, when I see you, it always remind me to feed the fish, he said. That's good, I'll make a cuppa, Sienna said. Shall we sit in the garden, Roy? It's a gorgeous day. A good chat is always part of my visit, especially when I bring his favourite cake. Roy says, listening to the guards, birds makes me happy. Me too. His lovely neighbour, Bella, Betty, watches out for him. The next stop is at Julia and Tim's, where I am greeted by their children, Bob and Jazz. Julia has young onset dementia and was diagnosed at 42. Julia is now in her mid-40s. Tim cares for her with the children. Tim and I always have a catch-up so I can check to see how they are all coping. He works from home, which can be difficult. Fortunately, his employer is very understanding. It's getting harder for the children, but they're doing their best. Would you like me to have a talk with them, said Sienna. Yes, he said. Bob and Jazz, can I have a chat about your mum's dementia? Molly at school says mummy will forget my name. She couldn't find the bathroom yesterday. I had to take her to it. And Billy Hill said she's pretending as only old people get dementia. She says the same things again and again. Dementia affects the way people think, talk and act. Anyone can get dementia, not just older people. Your mummy has young onset dementia, which is not so common. Maybe I can come into the school sometime and talk to the children and teachers to help them understand more about it. Mummy may forget your name, but she won't forget how you made her feel. She loves you both very much. What happens with people living with dementia is that they forget what they said, which is why Mummy says the same thing lots of times. Her brain doesn't realise that she said it. This is why Mummy forgot where the bathroom was yesterday. She needs you her little helpers. Maybe one of you could draw a picture of a toilet and stick it on the door. This will help her remember where it is. I always make sure I take a break during the day, said Sienna. My final call is at Miriam and Jacob's. Jacob has Alzheimer's and multiple sclerosis and is nearing the end of his life. Jacob wishes to die at home. Miriam wants to honour his wishes and I'm here to help them through. OK, I'll nip to the shops and meet my sisters for a coffee, said Miriam. Great, we'll see you later. We'll be fine, said Sienna. He loves me reading poetry with Deserata's favourite. He also loves rock and roll and comes alive when I play music for him. Woohoo! We're dancing around the room. You are a child of the universe, no less than the trees and the stars. You have a right to be here. Time to say goodbye to Jacob. My gran always used to say to me that giving makes me smile inside. 
I know exactly what she meant. As I feel a warm glow from within, I've found my purpose. Thank you, everyone. Oh, Gina, thank you so much for sharing that. It was lovely. So we've come to the end of our webinar. Thank you so, so much for your time, for sharing your energy, sharing your enthusiasm, your stories. I'm just making sure we've got, I really, oh, Susie said, I really connect with this story as it sounds a lot like mine. It's a great idea. Oh, Sally can't wait for the book. Oh, <laughs> brilliant. Oh, they're all coming in there. Thank you. This is such a familiar story. Thank you. So true to us all that story. Thank you. On behalf of everyone, Gina, thank you so much for doing what you do and for sharing it with us today. Thank you so much, everyone. Lots of love. Thank, thank you for joining you. in. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.